Welcome to the TBS Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Aikman, and today we'll be talking to Dr. Doug Petrovich about his new book, his upcoming movie, and everything going on at TBS this fall. I'm going to hop right in because you have been super busy over the say, last, what, how many months would you say? Of 12, 15 months. 12 to 15 months of just stuff going on. You've recently published a new article. Um, would you mind telling me about that? Sure. The article is called the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakan. Okay. Lachish is a site in Israel. It's one of the important Canaanite sites of the middle of the second millennium BC. Okay. And so it's occupied by Canaanites. The Israelites come along under Joshua at the end of the 15th century, so we say that this is probably around 1406 to 1405 BC, and they attack Lachish, and we read about this in chapter 10 of the book of Joshua. And so it's one of the cities, that, cities that's destroyed, and it takes them two days to overpower and overtake the city, and they probably killed all the inhabitants. Um, there was a an inscription left behind at the end of what's called the Late Bronze Age I period, which ends in about 1400. And that inscription is written in the proto-consonantal script. And of course, that means the script, the alphabetic script of the first consonants. So it's the first alphabet ever made. And this is, of course, related to the first book that I published. But this is the oldest um, attested Hebrew inscription that's found in the land of Canaan while the Israelites were living there in the second millennium BC. Okay, so that's, and it's found in a milk bowl, is that? Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. It's basically a, a potsherd. So, and of course in antiquity, virtually everything that people ate and drank from outside of some stone vessels and some other things, some glassware later, um, virtually everything is clay, is made from clay. And clay is very brittle. So it has a short shelf life, you know, your pots and your bowls and your cups and your goblets and everything else that you eat and drink out of. So once they crack or, or break, they accidentally fall down, you know, a child knocks it from a table down to the ground and it breaks, that's it, it's, it's done, you can't use it anymore. So the pot sherds that fall, um, that, that break apart once the, um, once the bowl or whatever it is, the item falls and breaks, what they would often do, or occasionally would do, is the ancient people, if they could write, they would take that one of those pieces of, of that pot or something, and they would write on it. And that's what was done with this. Um, it was painted in, in dark black ink on top of this, um, uh, this, this pot shirt, actually on the inside of it. On the outside of it, there's paint from its original um, uh, beautification after it was um, fired in a kiln. and and then it was painted. Um, but on the inside, they, they decided, somebody decided to write something, and it says, um, servant in charge of, uh, of honey, which is fascinating because it's saying that this Hebrew person who wrote on the inscription, it's basically like a, like a business card. He gave his title. He was servant who overseeing or in charge of the honey. And what's fascinating about that is when, when God is preparing the people for their entry into Canaan, he says to them that they are going to be entering into a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And oddly enough, the guy who signs this business card says that he's the servant who's in charge of honey, which is fascinating. And it's on a milk bowl. It's a certain kind of bowl that's been called, for other reasons, uh, by archeologists, it's been called a milk bowl. Um, it's actually an imported piece of pottery from the land of Cyprus, from the island of Cyprus. Um, but it's fascinating because that then gives us a, a connection to something we read about in the Bible that's completely contemporary with the meaning that was, that was painted right onto that ostrichum. And in, uh, so you've used this word in the, in the title and then again now, help me out here, I have a limited vocabulary. W what is an ostrichum? Okay, it's just a fancy way of saying a potsherd, okay. a broken off piece of pottery. But 
with the uh, caveat that it's a, not a typical potsherd that just sits there and, you know, gets buried over time, but somebody writes on it. And once okay. somebody writes on it, it becomes an ostracon. And that's just okay. the word we use for it. So, so in your article, what's the, the main thrust of the argument that you're making? Is it about uh, evidences that the alphabet that you see here is the proto-continental script? Is it arguments about the, the theological importance of the, the milk and honey tie-in that you're talking about? Or is it, is it something else entirely? First of all, I'd say that the, the main tangential point okay. in all of this is that it, it verifies, it confirms, it, it affirms everything that I published in my first book, which is basically that the world's oldest alphabet is Hebrew and that it exists in the form of inscriptions that have, um, that have remained down to our day that date from 1840 B.C. to 1446 B.C., the year of the Exodus. And this inscription is only 40 years later. And what do you know? That's the very time frame um, that the Bible says that they entered into the land of Canaan. But the main point in the article is that we now have evidence, physical evidence, in the form of writing of what some Hebrew person wrote on his own um, that can be dated to a certain point in history that archaeologically there's no option, no other option. It's the, it's the, uh, near the very end of the second phase of the Late Bronze One Age, which we call Late Bronze Age 1b, which ends in 1400 BC. So this gives us, us clear evidence that the Israelites are there and that this is the time of the conquest. And, there, and, and it verifies for us that there was a conquest because where the potsherd was found, it's right inside the city wall where there was this huge breach that was made in the wall by somebody who was evidently attacking. And it's connected, physically connected, to a, what's called a burn layer, which is, which is physical evidence where there was a fire, a destruction. When somebody invaded the city and burned it, yeah, broke down the wall yeah. and burnt something right there where they breached through, through the wall. So that inscription is connected with that moment in time. So that really is the main thrust of what I'm trying to argue within the, within the article. At this moment on the campus of the Bible Seminary, we are cultivating biblical leaders that are rooted in the Word. I love the Bible Seminary because of the focus on the inerrant Word of God. I came to the Bible Seminary out of a desire to know the Bible. Whether you're a ministry leader, college or high school student, pastor, or simply have a desire to learn the Word of God, there's room for you at the Bible Seminary. Let's rejoin the conversation. Would you mind sharing with us just more broadly a little bit uh, about what the kind of current mainline academic thought is and, and how that breaks with yours so that we could get a better understanding of uh, just how important an archaeological discovery like this is. Sure, and it goes back to my first book, The World's Oldest Alphabet, um, which is now out of print, but I just recently found out that my publisher, Carta, from Jerusalem, is going to reprint the book. So um, a lot of my ideas um, were published in this book. This book literally took me thousands of hours to write. Um, well, I should say to research, to right. think through, and then to write, and then to edit, and then to... The whole process. The whole process, yeah. right. So um, uh, in, in my book, I'm essentially trying to demonstrate that, that we have evidence in the form of writings from the Hebrews themselves that date back to the period of what we call the sojourn in Egypt, um, which of course, you know, the revolutionary idea here is I don't know how much you're aware of this or how much our viewers are aware of this, but in the universities around the world, including the United States, if not, if not the United States kind of as the, as the trendsetter for this, any time that, that secular professors get the opportunity to talk about the ancient times of the Bible, at least this period, the second millennium BC, the Israelites, and this potential that they lived in Egypt and they, they battled the, the Egyptians where they were slaves and so forth. Um, all of this now is taught in our university, and virtually every university, there are rare exceptions, but in most universities, it's taught that this is historical fiction, that, that this never really happened. Because they say, we have no evidence that Israelites were there. 
And the Bible says they were there 430 years. You'd think if they're there that long, there should be evidence that attests to their being there for 430 years. So when I come along showing evidence now that they lived there for 430 years, especially in starting with the very written form, what they themselves wrote for posterity, because I'm breaking the, the cultural norm that says there, there's no evidence for Israelites in Egypt for those 430 years, and no longer can this be a laughing stock among the scholars and university professors that they can then pass on to their students who are, in many cases, you know, given my age, um, my children and, and current university students of their age who are taking classes in university, they're hearing these things and their faith in the historicity of the Bible is called into question. And if they have no answers, if they have no rebuttal, if they have no evidence to counter these arguments, it's a, it's a very difficult spot they're in because now they would have to concede their intellectual integrity. And so what my work does is um, it gives them something that they can use, tangible evidence, to fight back against the claims that these university uh, professors have against them. Wow. Uh, I appreciate that, although I'm not an archaeological student myself. Uh, being in for, for several years the university sphere and, and seeing that firsthand where people uh, sometimes I felt like were dropping like flies around me who came in with the faith and felt challenged and didn't feel like the, there were the maybe intellectual tools available or provided to them to say, hey, the narrative that you're being fed is not the only narrative out there. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, in all likelihood, it's not the true narrative. Right, mm -hmm. that you're being fed. Um, so I don't think you can overstate the importance of, of what you're doing. You also talk about that in a, in a book you're editing. Isn't that is that correct? Yes. So um, I am the editor of a book that's in the process of being written. There are going to be 11 chapters and maybe I forget how many, eight or nine um, authors that will help compose all of these chapters. And basically, it's dealing with the time of the conquest itself. So the article I'm publishing in hopefully November of this year in uh, Bible in Spade, so you can look for it in Bible in Spade, I'm, I'm going to be expanding that out and having a longer version of it, a more well-argued version, as a chapter in the book. And there are going to be other chapters in the book about that time period when the Israelites, um, when Moses has left the scene and Joshua takes over and they... They cross the Jordan River and head west and enter into Canaan and subdue the land as God instructed them to do. That conquest really has never been um, argued or nobody has attempted to verify from archaeological and epigraphical means, and epigraphical means ancient inscriptions, that we have evidence for this event. So this book will be the first of its kind never attempted before. And we will argue that the, that the um, conquest of Canaan under Joshua by God took place uh, between 1406 and 1400 BC. And there are lots of lines of evidence that can show that this is true. This campaign is being launched to raise funds to be able to publish two books. One actually is the republishing of my first book. It's called The World's Oldest Alphabet. And it attempts to prove that Hebrew is the language behind the world's oldest alphabetic script. So these inscriptions date from 1840 BC to about 1446 BC. The second book is a new book that is the result of 10 years of research and writing. And this book is called Origins of the Hebrews. It's a companion volume to the first book, but this volume is important because it gives all of the archaeological evidence for the Israelites living in Egypt for the 430 year period that the Bible talks about as the sojourn in Egypt. While any amount would be wonderful to contribute toward the campaign, if anyone is going to pledge a $500 donation, what I will do for that is get you a signed copy of the book and send it to you. And for anyone who donates $1,000, I will give you the opportunity to have a conference via Zoom or any other platform online and you can invite all of the friends and family that you want and we'll spend five hours together walking through a lot of the discoveries that are found in my book. 
So thank you for anything that you're able to give toward this campaign. It is a wonderful endeavor. It is a wonderful opportunity to see something come into print that's truly going to make an impact both on the kingdom of God and on the nation of Israel. Thank you. Let's rejoin the conversation. It's, it's, it's incredible to me because I work with young people, right, with students, and, and it's awesome to see archaeological work in the thousands, you know, you mentioned countless hours that, that go into creating resources like this to help connect the, the stories that, that children read in Scripture with historical events that, that perfectly mirror them and, and line up, right? Because I think that, um, I, I remember, you know, it calls me back to a friend of mine that, that talks about how much his faith grew the day he realized that he wasn't just reading stories, mm -hmm. right, in Sunday school, that, that he's reading about things that actually happened in our world, right? Mm -hmm. that, that helped lead us as, as cultures and societies to the place that we are today mm -hmm. and, and seeing God's hand in that. Um, and so to, to see work like this being done to say, hey, the conquest happened at this time mm -hmm. and, and, and this is something that's a, an irrefutable historical fact, mm -hmm. right? Um, Can I throw out a quick story that yes. relates to what you were just saying? Of course. Uh, you brought it to mind. So soon after my book came out, uh, my first book, uh, The World's Oldest Alphabet, and this is 2017. Okay. Um, and, and I live, of course, in the Houston area in Katy. I was contacted by a high school chemistry teacher who lives in the Dallas area. And he asked if he could come down and have lunch with me. I said, sure. So he came down, we had lunch down the street at Schlotsky's. And I remember exactly what we, where we sat and what we were talking about and what we ate. Um, we had a great conversation. He said, he said, I have to tell you how much your book means to me. And here's what he said. He said, you know, I recently became a Christian, not, you know, not that long ago, just a couple of, two, three years ago, became a Christian. And as I studied all of the evidence and heard all of the attacks against the Bible, I struggled with whether this was true or not. So I decided to study Hebrew. And he told me that he studied um, Hebrew grammar, which as you know, takes a year approximately, unless you speed through it and you're a whiz. Um, for most people, it takes about a year to go through the grammar. He studied it for about a year. He finished, and as soon as he finished studying Hebrew, my book came out. He found out about it, he bought a copy, and he read it. And he said, th he said this is what God used to minister to my heart, to convince me that this is all true, that it's historically um, verifiable, and that it happened just as the Bible says it did. That's how powerful these tools can be in the hands of people that are ripe and ready and need this kind of thing to see and, and to experience the value of seeing the truthfulness of the Word of God um, that's, that's validated by historical evidence. It's cool to see God at work and in, in using, you know, your your efforts and, and your labor, right, and to see fruit uh, come from your your ministry, because um, this is a form of ministry, absolutely, right. And then sometimes I think we don't we don't always think about authors and academic work as a as a type of ministry, unless you're, which you do teach as well, but unless you're when you're not lecturing, but um, but really it is, and it, it's a way to minister to a broad audience of people, right, um, because not everybody can come to Katie and, and has the privilege of sitting under you as you teach Hebrew here, um, like I get to do. But but everybody could go and pick up a copy of your book and, and learn that sure. way, wherever they're at. Yeah. Right? Jump on Amazon and it's at your door the next day. Yeah. And you have another book, actually, correct, that, that is in the works right now? So that book is now completed and it's in the hands of the typesetter and awaiting... Um, that process to be completed, and so when it's when it's ready to be printed, then then it will be printed and come out from the public from the publisher. So hopefully, um, early to mid fall, it would be ready to come out. And it's called Origins of the Hebrews: New Evidence for Israelites in Egypt from Joseph to the Exodus. And basically, that book is where I started as far as the writing of books. And so that goes back to research that began in 2012, and I started writing the book probably either in, I forget now, in 2012 or 2013. 
And so that book is kind of like the greater whole. And then within that whole, uh, before I could ever finish writing that book, all of a sudden, in, in finding evidence that ties the Israelites to Egypt at that period, uh, those 430 years that they were there, in the midst of all of that, that's when I realized that Hebrew is the language behind this oldest alphabetic script in the world. And so that kind of sent me on a tangent, and I was compelled, I believe by God, to complete that book first. So I finished the tangent first, and then it allowed me the chance to go back and finish the first book that I started, which is Origins of the Hebrews. So this is a more holistic approach, looking at all kinds of archaeological evidence to verify that there were Israelites in Egypt for that period of time that the Bible says the sojourn in Egypt happened, beginning in 1876 BC. So this is, once again, it's groundbreaking evidence. It's never been put out there before, and for the most part. And even in Middle Egyptian inscriptions, right? So this is hieroglyphics, identifying several biblical characters with certainty and one probably. The certain ones are Joseph, his two eldest sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and Manasseh's uh, son named Shechem that you only read about in one place in the Bible, it's in the book of Joshua, Joshua 17. And all those are for sure, and then probably we can identify Jacob as well, oddly enough. So the evidence is amazing and it's overwhelming. So I'm really excited to see this book come out. It's going to be uh, another game changer. You're teaching Hebrew this fall, right? At the Bible Seminary, is that correct? That's right. That's one of the three classes I'll be teaching. Okay. So it's uh, introductory Hebrew or Hebrew grammar. It's two semesters, so the fall semester and then the winter, spring, whatever you want to call it, semester. Um, so basically from scratch, you're starting, from, you know, the students are starting from scratch. So anyone would be able to take that course with no background um, in biblical languages. So I'll be teaching um, Hebrew grammar. And then I'll also be teaching third semester Greek, which is Greek exegesis. So for students who've already studied a year of Greek, we'll be going into the, some of the, the deeper things of the grammar and the language and how that works with um, the letters, especially of Paul and other places in the New Testament. So those are two of the classes that I'll be teaching. The third one is also like Hebrew, it's open to, to anyone. Uh, and that is um, a Bible study methods class. So we're going to look at how is it that we should be studying the Bible? What are the rules that are involved? We call this hermeneutics in the field, right? How do you interpret the Bible? Um, how do you study the Bible? Um, how do you approach the text? How do you uh, ask questions? How do you make good observations? All of these are little elements that are connected to this question of, of how we're supposed to be studying the Bible so that we're, we're not just um, reading it in a rudimentary way, but we're digging deeper to be able to understand, you know, the depths of it. I just wanted to thank you one more time for coming on. It's been just an absolute blast to get to learn more and dialogue with you about some of these things that you're passionate about and the groundbreaking work that you've been doing. My pleasure and thanks for having me on.